In 63 BCE, at the age of 36, Julius Caesar shocked everybody by announcing that he was running for the office of Pontifex Maximus. He was still a minor political figure. He had not yet served his term as preacher. He took on massive debts in order to finance this campaign. And when his political elders tried to convince him to get out of the race, he redoubled his efforts and threw himself even further into debt. On election day, according to Plutarch, Caesar told his mother something along the lines of, Today, you will either see me as Pontifex Maximus or go into exile. He won a close three-way race. This electoral victory would have repercussions for centuries. So what was the Pontifex Maximus? Let's put it in the simplest possible terms. He was the highest elected religious official in the Roman Republic, and once elected, he served for life. You'll notice that I threw a caveat in there, elected. Maybe it won't surprise you to learn that it gets more complicated when you look into it. There was one person that outranked the Pontifex Maximus. He was called the Rex Sacrorum, which is deceptively hard to say. It means something like the King of the Sacred. Once appointed, he also served for life, kinda. The Rex Sacrorum was actually itself a split position, consisting of a husband and wife team. The wife was called the Regina Sacrorum, and she had duties separate from her husband. One could not exist without the other, so if one of the two died or the couple got divorced, the position was vacant and a new couple was appointed. The official job of the Rex and Regina Sacrorum was to keep the gods happy. Full stop, that's it. What that meant in practice was that they were each responsible for performing many complicated religious ceremonies, including animal sacrifices. They also had to live a pure life, which meant a lot of things, but most importantly, it meant that politics and the military were completely off limits. The Rex Sacrorum was undeniably a powerless figurehead. But let's put that to the side. Let's look at the Pontifex Maximus's actual responsibilities. I'd say his most meaningful job was regulating public morality. He was a watchdog over the Roman people and more importantly, over its politicians. He had the power to unilaterally issue fines whenever he decided that somebody violated a religious custom or a cultural taboo. Along the same lines, he was also authorized to go before the Senate and speak on legislation representing a group called the College of Pontiffs. What was the College of Pontiffs? This was a group of pontiffs or priests that met with the Pontifex Maximus behind closed doors to vote on new laws that would govern religious life or public morality. It's important to note that once these laws were agreed upon and publicly announced by the Pontifex Maximus, they had the force of law, and the Senate had no say in the matter. In the beginning, there were five in the college, later nine, and by the late Republic, fifteen. These pontiffs had some other duties, like serving as judges in religious court cases, although it's unclear how common this was. Their most important job was becoming experts on Roman religious law and guiding the Pontifex Maximus. Keep in mind that these pontiffs were expected to have normal political careers, and their role on the College of Pontiffs was kind of a side gig. Just like the Pontifex Maximus, pontiffs served for life. When a pontiff died, the college voted internally to select his replacement. New pontiffs were usually picked from prominent families at a young age, and trained on the job by their colleagues. Briefly, in the late Republic, new pontiffs were elected by the people, but that reform didn't last long. The Pontifex Maximus also oversaw a group called the Flamen. These men were also priests, but appointed directly by the Pontifex Maximus for life. There were 15 of them, each the head of a cult devoted to a different deity. The Flamen to Jupiter, Mars, and Romulus were the three most prestigious ones, and were usually given to members of prominent families. Unlike the Pontiffs, Flamen were subject to a litany of religious restrictions. For example, it was forbidden for them to see a dead body, or to travel outside of Rome. This meant that while they were technically allowed to have political careers, all of the good stuff was off-limits. Also, they weren't allowed to see a table without food on it, which might be the world's worst superpower. I can't decide if it would be more annoying to know a Flamen or to be a Flamen. The Pontifex Maximus was also responsible for appointing Vestal Virgins which was an order of women that maintained an eternal flame in the center of the city. These were easily the most powerful women in Rome. They could own property, vote, and even free slaves at will. 
Each one was appointed for 30 years, but most chose to stay on after their time was up. The Pontifex Maximus worked right next door to the Temple of Vesta in a building called the Regia, which had once been the site of the royal palace during the monarchy. This was where the College of Pontiffs met. It's also where Rome housed its official calendar, which was so broken that the Pontifex Maximus needed to manually add days to the end of every year in order for it to make sense. This was also where Rome's most sacred artifacts were kept. Perhaps most famous were the Spears of Mars, which were said to vibrate whenever Rome was about to befall some disaster. We are told that Caesar saw them vibrating the night before his own assassination. Speaking of which, after Caesar's assassination, one of his deputies, Lepidus, was elected the new Pontifex Maximus. This same Lepidus became the junior member of the Second Triumvirate, with Octavian and Mark Antony. After Octavian became the Emperor Augustus and consolidated power, he forced Lepidus to move to the countryside, where he retained his title but no influence. Years later, when Lepidus died of old age, the office passed to Augustus without much fuss, and the headquarters of the Pontifex Maximus quietly moved from the Regia to the new Imperial Palace, and for the next 400 years, that's where it stayed. <laughs>